architect Divya Chakravarti. She completed her undergraduate studies from SRM University and she went on to pursue her masters in historic preservation and urbanism and study of the built environment from the University of California, Los Angeles. She went on to work for the Department of Planning and Preservation for the city of Pasadena, California. She also did a brief stint of work for Historic Scotland, Edinburgh, UK. She had also worked on conservation projects like Kalsa Mahal, Gokhale Hall in Chennai and Marimalapa Educational Trust in Mysore. She is currently working as a director of Samrakshan Heritage Consultancy. She is also a co-founder of the Artisan Reprisal of Traditional Materials, Method and Technology. She goes on to conduct workshops to revive traditional and lost methods of construction. Welcome to the UGC lecture series for Bachelors of Architecture. The subject we are discussing is evolution of human settlements. The topic we'll be delving into is human settlements in a changing world. We shall be discussing the city of the future and future of cities and sustainable cities. Now on to city of the future and future of cities. When you actually discuss future city, we shall do so with an example with Songdo in South Korea, which was, and we'll see how this was developed, how this has grown for us to realize how a future city should be and what is it that our country can do for the same. This was built up from ground up, from scratch in 2005 with over $40 billion invested into its creation and it was opened in 2009. Songdo is one of the one example of what a smart and a future city is going to look like and is perhaps on the very forefront of this very evolution. These new types of cities typically leverage new technologies, infrastructure, design and planning techniques to create what can only be described as a city which acts as a living, breathing organism that can communicate with its residents and within itself. Here is South Korea, Songdo, the site area, the total area and the master plan. You can see it was not done, laid out on any other urban theory of say the Radburn layout or anything else. It was meant to be done such that it sat on the site, it had the purposes of mixed use, there was no residential area, no commercial area, no entertainment area. It has all been combined. It has a lead ND pilot program. It has a lot of other technological advancements incorporated into the master plan. The total thing is about 10 square miles. The parameters if you look at it like we discussed, smart transportation, smart energy, smart building, smart waste and water management. This is a typical section through all the commercial and mixed use zones. That's the term of the future literally, a mixed use zone. We shouldn't have a res completely residential area. We shouldn't have a completely commercial area. It's only when you have a mixed use zone, you can reduce traffic congestion and other such related activities because it, is, it should have a 5 to 10 kilometer radius where no one should have to go beyond that. You can see these are the typical areas zoned out. There is a height in play. The tall buildings are here, the shorter buildings are here. You can see in elevation such that there is adequate wind flow. When you make sure there is adequate wind flow in the city, you can reduce your consumption of air conditioning. Similarly, over here you can see there is a, the shorter buildings in the forefront, tall again in the center and again there is a spillage on the other side. So when you actually have this constant play in the height of buildings that is pre-designed, you can actually make sure your city is better designed, better with better lighting and ventilation to ensure lesser consumption of resources. Now here if you look at it, you have the public transport particularly laid out. The UTC bus stop, subway, bike path and water taxi because there is a water body over there. But you can clearly see that road transportation or cars are completely discouraged. 
even if it is a car it has to be a hybrid car or a battery charging car you should have these battery charging points bike racks and pedestrian walkways so all of this was completely encouraged buildings need to be smart too your roof has to be smart the roofs have wind turbines it has a ventilated skylight motorized helio slats so when you have these motorized slats it actually can moderate the kind of light that is going to come in the kind of ventilation that is going to come in skylights like everyone knows a lot of daylight comes in so when you have skylights you can reduce consumption of electricity in office buildings through the daytime you need to have water harvesting channels and sedim roof or green roof sometimes roofs could be performing that of a urban farm now if you actually look at this songdo is over here on the right you have other asian cities this is the master plan community city of synergy is songdo other and you can see the clear play of height of buildings they are not against skyscrapers there is nothing wrong in having skyscrapers but the skyscrapers have to be strategically placed so that you do not have a concrete jungle that's getting heated up here you have other asian cities which is pretty much a concrete jungle multimodal transportation they encourage 10 minute walk to work versus it just takes 10 minute to get a parking spot in other cities here you have living clean and green smog and pollution on the other end residential units higher quality at significantly lower cost not so in other parts of asia commercial office space higher quality lower cost and better accessibility to open space and finally open space as such is so minimal in other asian cities versus 40% of songdo is dedicated to green and open space so you can see a smart city is also a green city this is where the thumb and finger uh, analogy comes in all green and smart cities need not be futuristic cities but a future city has to be green and smart in saving up the resources and making sure that its building systems its transportation systems are all smart if you look at the education you have very good schools universities all of that within songdo itself quality of life you have international hospitals art center convention center exhibition hall and many other facilities entertainment and leisure again you don't need to go out you have the five star sheraton hotel shopping towns shopping complexes they have of canal walk shops a golf club so everything is self contained and because of this congestion or more people going in and out traveling in cars all that is reduced and even if you have to travel the public transport system is quite advanced so now to discuss yes songdo has spent 40 million dollars but how sustainable is it it has 40% green spaces zero energy buildings the lack of emission of harmful gases and instant recycling plants so all of this does make it a sustainable city now all countries might not have 40 million dollars to invest but that's exactly what they want to suggest that look at the money as an investment because you're going to get returns really soon versus an expenditure of the government because if you look at it as expenditure you're going to think as oh my god where are we going to get these kind of funds but if you look at it as investment you will have a lot of private sector players who are coming in the public sector will always will be getting money from its tax payers but definitely a model city has to be started on to see how sustainable it is for a indian climatic situation now we have seen one end of the spectrum the city of the future now by just interchanging the words we can change the entire meaning what is you actually think about the future of our cities the city of the future holds a lovely image of green spaces open spaces happy people in a clean background but if you look at the current situation of our many urban centers and cities in our country or across the world and if it continues to grow as it is in today's context where will it land us there is actually a main major difference in the outcome between the two 
they can actually never be the same as already many cities in our country are already crowded and thriving cities and they tend to change organically over a period of time rather than someone coming and starting something from scratch. It is true that urban policies and laws are laid to control the growth of a city in a regularized manner but usually policies only provide direction, they don't do much anything else, they are not laws. The future of the cities depends solely on its residents and their ways of life. For instance, we have old cities that have transformed enormously like Old Delhi to New Delhi, Madras to Chennai, Bombay to Mumbai. These cities have not only grown in size and population which has led to congestion, overcrowding, slums, disparity within the urban fabric in terms of housing, facilities and civic buildings. The future for such cities might be planned on a large and grand scale, anticipating competition with other global cities. But most often, the poor people and their needs are ignored. Their basic necessities have to be accomplished before considering the future of cities. On one hand, we have skyscrapers, global offices, headquarters, posh malls, global brands, but very much in the same city, a few hundred yards away, you will find slums with poor sanitation facilities, bad roads and unemployed people living in squalor. Before we think of smart and sustainable cities, we have to consider the needs of all the people in the city, towns and villages. Living in a town or a rural setting should not technically hamper the quality of life. This is where the first disparity in basic amenities begin and urbanization occurs. It is only as a result of urbanization that cities are getting congested. If villages or village life or rural life does not mean a backward life, people wouldn't find the need to move to a city. If you have internet, if you have malls, if you have uh, theatres, if you have good entertainment and cultural centres in towns and villages, the need to come to a major urban city would reduce tremendously. If a village offered good transportation, education, healthcare and well-constructed homes with good entertainment pockets, why would there be a need to overcrowd the cities? Before we look into futuristic cities, we need to analyze and re-examine the current cities and their future. If the current urban scenario is not repaired, the future will bring about more disparity and increase the problems that lies within the city. It will be like cosmetic surgery. Outwardly, you will think that person is looking very beautiful or it might all things might seem fine, but inside there are a lot of decaying elements. If you look at the different stress factors in an urban scenario, in not only in India but other parts of Asia, you have the slums in Manila. This is in Porto Pros in Haiti. This is an apartment complex in China. Here you have congestion, which is the second stress factor. Streets in the center of London. Go slow, that in Lagos, Nigeria. Rush hour in Los Angeles. You can't even see the road, basically. It's a sea of vehicles. Third is urban stress. Environmental problems or brown agenda, which is basically solid waste management. What can be done? Pollution. All kinds of waste just entering the water bodies, smog and land pollution, air pollution, all of that becomes a huge issue in urban cities. Social problems is the main important thing in terms of disparity. If you look at a family in India with so many children and no way of life, no food, no homes, you have this not only occurring in India but other parts of the developed countries and developing countries as well. Now on to sustainable cities which will take us truly into what kind of future we can look forward into. If you look at urban planning, it has grown quite a bit from the garden city concept in the 1900s to the ecological city and the urban sprawl period in the 1970s to the demand for a sustainable city which is now. If you look at sustainable land use, you need to have optimal site, cost accounting of nature and the building, sustainable building strategies. 
if you look at the different concepts that have come about in the last 25 30 years village home concept in davis california this is considered the ecological city urban sustainability as a solar design natural drainage and edible landscape the creator of this concept is michael corbett in 1975 it was inspired by the medieval village of spain solar design should cut daily family energy budget and when residential developments implement sustainable principles both economic and environmental benefits will also follow cities must be sustainable more than three quarters of the world's population will have lived in cities by 2050 if the cities are sustainable it will greatly affect the earth's environment so architects and city planners can considerably contribute to help to prevent pollution and improve our planet's environment as well as the government all cities must be sustainable for the future when you think of the word sustainable it is usually misinterpreted all like we just saw songdo as an example yes that is a sustainable city but just having high technology does not make a city sustainable it should have zero emission it should have carbon dioxide that is on the lower side it should have great good oxygen and air quality it should have a lot of other things that support a good quality of life that's what makes a city truly sustainable yes it can be technologically high flying that is obviously a main component of a city and urban life a compact and mixed use city reduces the need for transportation zoning of function makes people depend on their private transportation like if you have three different zones one for residents one for entertainment and one for commercial so then the need for cars comes into being but if you have compact nodes it can reduce the use of cars and people can either walk or use bicycles so they should have a common area where the residents the commercial and the entertainment sector are all mixed within a particular area and that would be a truly well developed compact area how do you connect the compact nodes if you keep growing like this this is the open linear system this again leads to sprawl because from here if i have to go to the fourth component it's going to take a longer time so compact nodes have to be joined by mass transportation like train system where the centers are connected as well as the outer ring roads are also connected energy reduction compact city can also reduce energy consumption obviously goes without saying once a city becomes compact the number of cars will reduce and if at all cars are taken it will be taken over short distances and there you will be promoting more cycles and more people walking so that's a main result and the second thing is when you promote public transportation that again reduces the individual car consumption of fuel as well as pollution from individual cars so if you actually look at it only one unit of uh, is supplied to a city some energy is lost over the trip and two units of energy is lost at heat so this is the conventional system where power is generated far to a city now in a compact system power is generated in the district so heat of a secondary product can also be reused so chp is nothing but combined heat and power so chp supplies heat and electricity to the region heat will not be wasted that will be used by another industry or sub industry so chps can turn refuse also into energy if you take clean refuse you can actually get about 2 third units of fuel and if you take the output of heat and electricity you get about 1 unit of fuel so when you actually think of reducing the energy consumption it makes a huge impact on how far that city will go and how the citizens will also benefit from that this is the compact and mixed use city example the river park project in pittsburgh pennsylvania the small neighborhood of 6 acres with about 700 residence units hotels art venues retail offices and variety of parks people can satisfy their daily necessities including their jobs in only a two block walkable neighborhood without a car the big 8th street is paved for pedestrian community spine 
this is the community spine and this is the entire sector that we are looking at you have only the nodes which are used for pedestrian activities and if everything is contained within the sex acres it makes it completely eco-friendly in terms of lack of use of fuels reduce pollution from cars and other motorized vehicles the compact and mixed use city example this is Mayoroka another example the technopolis is divided into three communities each community is about 2000 residents and arranged to a walkable or bicyclable distance then public transportation connects the centers of them so within individual communities if you need to go you need to it's only a 10 minute distance you can walk or use the bicycle but if you want to use connect to the other things other parts of the city or other nodes there is public transportation leading to them so again lack the first targeted node is the road road vehicles public transport all of this reduces the city automatically becomes greener and more sustainable how you can go about reducing energy consumption first step to reduce pollutant fuel dependency we use a lot of energy for lighting heating and cooling we can reduce this by utilizing nature such as sunlight and wind or passive cooling techniques this is the japanese shoji you see as a simple example a very big opening which takes in a lot of natural light but filtered light through a building so you don't need artificial light during the daytime and because it's filtered it's not the bright harsh sunlight that's going to cause this damage or hurt our eyes this is a sliding door and it can actually moderate the temperature and the light and protect us from the wind too so this can be moved according to different times of the day it's manually done it's very simple you can control them easily by just shutting it open and close if you look at the city's outline these are certain proposals given the contour of a city is set considering that natural light can reach the utmost space and wind can be used as a natural cooling system and ventilation this is what we discussed even with Songdo you need to make sure your tall buildings are strategically placed so they can cause a good tunnel effect and make sure there is movement of air even in the core or the center of the city as against the parts which are in the outer laying areas six mixed use neighborhoods specifically create parks buildings with several heights are grouped so that the obstruction of sunlight wind current and views can be changed this is the natural ventilation for a building the roof form actually creates natural ventilation and reduces necessity of mechanical ventilation the surrounding trees uh, clear the dust in the air and also provide for moisture this is like instead of we working for the buildings we have to make sure that the buildings are actually working for us energy source should be recyclable and unlimited it must not damage the natural cycle sunlight and wind power is popular for reproductible energy source waste from lumbering is burned as energy fuel at biomass chp plant this supplies electricity to about 3000 residence units and all commercial buildings in the commune 100 percent wind powered community in rockport missouri this loses hinwall farm as four wind turbines on an agricultural land within the city of rockport these turbines do not take massive space so the ground areas which is prime is not occupied this is actually useful for small compact communities wind of only nine miles per hour can activate power production the turbines are directly connected to the city's main electrical lines rockport consumes about 13 million kilowatts of annually and lois hill wind farm can provide nearly 16 million kilowatts each year so that kind of substantial production will actually make the city green this kind of concept will appeal what kind of green buildings we can come up with architecture and community should appeal sustainability visually and sensibly not only functionally but also practically because very important thing to create successful sustainable communities in the consciousness of people living there the people should not be shortchanged in any which way on the other hand in the whole frame of sustainable living they shouldn't be losers in terms of financial 
bargains they shouldn't lose on or they should not have to pay too much to live in a clean environment that is our requirement and our right now nash's island civilization is an urban sustainability project for global civilization of about 1.5 billion humans living in 500 compact cities this came about by roderick nash urban compactness as an essential element of sustainability human presence on earth to endure advance the rights of nature preserve wilderness between silt cities global population to maximize their intellectual and technology so when you actually look at these modules that we have seen different models have come about one where the building is smart and provides energy one where the entire population provides for energy third we have even seen where solar and wind energy can be used and then we have also seen of options where the urban planners have situated the city itself in such a way that it consumes less energy compact mixed use energy cities are also of the present now if you look at the hanover principles a guide to the search of sustainability insist on human rights and sustainability recognize the interaction of design with the environment consider the social and spiritual aspects of buildings and designed objects be responsible for the effect of design decisions ensure that objects have long term value you need to eliminate waste and consider the entire life cycle of designed objects make use of natural energy flows such as solar power and its derivatives you need to ensure open communities be humble and use nature as a model for design share knowledge strive for continuous improvement and encourage open communication among stakeholders for all of this to happen it has to have a lot of local participation strong local participation along with a very strong political background along with policy makers urban planners architects and even the citizens have a huge hand in this it's not sufficient that even common citizens are involved but also you have citizen communes that are formed communities that are formed that enable simple tasks like waste collection real reclamation of waste such that dry waste is collected differently can be recycled wet waste can be collected and used for energy consumption other wet waste can be used as fertilizer for plants and other agricultural needs all of this has to be done not only by the government because awareness has to start amongst the citizens for the government to come in and take the next step sustainable city within a sustainability watershed so urban sustainability is holistic diverse fractal and evolutionary this concept was created by margaret mcdonald in 93 transformation of los osos in california the holistic part was composed of interdependent and interconnected subsystems at multiple scales diversity in terms of decisions should enhance biological social cultural and economic diversity at all scales fractal in terms of design with nature based on chaos pattern of geometry evolutionary seeks efficiency through iteration so a lot of these people have taken up these smaller towns as examples and models and created a lot of these uh, models for us to learn from and that is the primary first step we need to take for any of our smart cities or green cities or sustainable cities we need to document the changes that we are making on them because it is only if we can learn from others that same way others can learn from us if the community is going to be a part of it other parts of the world can also see if a similar community exists how is it that it can be done green infrastructure urban sustainability as a regenerative urban system this can be achieved only if society incorporates regenerative energy and water flow systems of nature into its city vegetation modifies the bag environment so make sure you have a lot of plants that will bring in animals and other birds 
you need to have new residential concepts or new family units both are that are owner occupied and rented in a quality urban setting in which landscape areas social amenities and good architecture generate urban excellence so at the end of this we have seen the city of the future and the future of cities and we have also dealt with sustainable cities at the end of this we should be able to answer the following questions describe with an example the characteristics of a future city if the current trend continues what is the future of our cities describe the characteristics of a sustainable city discuss the hanover principles what are residential concepts discuss nash's island civilization that brings us to the end of this lecture thank you